I'm Jeremy Brock. Welcome to the BAFTA and BFI International Screenwriters Lecture Series for 2013. I was on the BAFTA Film Committee and discovered I was the only screenwriter who'd ever been on it. And after I got over the shock, I decided that the best I could do for my screenwriting brothers and sisters was to set up a lecture series in the name of BAFTA and we were able to bring the BFI in on that. This year we've got a fantastic lineup. We start with David S. Goya. We end with Richard Curtis and in between we have Hossein Amini, Susanna Grant and Tony Gilroy. These are serious heavyweights from the UK and from America. You will be inspired by these individuals. So now we have one of this country's leading screenwriters, Hossein Amini. There's a great skill in bringing novels to film and Hoss has the ability to marry his own voice and talent invisibly to that of another author. Not only to reduce the book to the film but to make that translation really vivid. So you see a film like Drive, incredibly visual, incredibly uh, adept. You think that's got to be the camera, that's got to be the director. Actually, when you look at the screenplay and when you realise how much of that's written, that's what true adaptation is. And I would love it if Hoss was able to speak to that. Hoss, uh, it's a real privilege to have you on this stage and I hope that we can explore some of the secrets of the craft through um, the conversation that we have today. And I thought what we do is start actually with the opening of Drive, which is a long sequence, um, but I think the audience is probably familiar with the film, and then look at how you uh, structured that afterwards. Brilliant heist. It would be easy to look at that and say, bravura direction, good storyboard work, where's the writing? Well, it, it is a fantastic piece of directing, I think. But, but I mean, the, the reason sort of I want to talk about this clip was because um, for me, a lot of screenwriting is, I mean, people's perceptions of it is that it's all about the dialogue. And it, the script, that's a seven page block of um, scene description, all those story beats were there. Um, and, and, and the genesis of it was, was that I went to, um, to meet the head of security at Universal because they were commissioning it. And the first thing he said to me was, there's no way you can have a police um, chase at the beginning because they'll have helicopters and the moment they have eyes on the car, there's no point, which is why I think so few car chase movies, you know, police chases really happen these days. And all the ones I've seen on TV, there's always that aerial footage. Um, but then that became a challenge, so sort of I went away and I thought, well, what if it's a roof? And he said, yeah, but they'll just cover it around the building. And then I thought, well, what if there's a crowd? And also from that, the thing that came, you know, so the idea was to set it, to, so it started with a basketball game at the Staples Centre, but then it's also, what was really fun about it was how do you, is, is mixing two pieces of sort of sound writing really, which is the commentary of the um, the basketball game, but also the police radio going on at the same time. So all of these things um, were scripted and then obviously enhanced by, by Nicholas Ruffin who directed it. But I think the point is that there's, there's so much um, visual writing, I think, you know, for any screenwriter. And I think some, that's sometimes something that we're not given credit for. Um, and, and it's a sort of, I, I, I love writing in pictures and, 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 and lots of pages without dialogue. So, I mean, that's really why I wanted to start with something like this. And it really started with the, the security guy. That's the thing, it wasn't, I can't even say it started with me. It started with the person who sort of went, well, that's impossible. Um, and, and rose to the challenge. Yeah, and it's sort of, so, so I, think, I think the whole thing is incredible. 
you know, incredibly collaborative and that's, that's part of the fun. And I think the research for me is one of the most important bits. And, and this, was, this was really something that came out of research. And then the other thing I remember doing was, um, I don't actually drive, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Did they know that when they hired you? They didn't. I didn't, te I didn't tell them I didn't drive. Um, I, I didn't tell them I'd failed my driving test seven times, but... <laughs> I, I did tell Nicholas Reffin, who's the director, and then in every interview he gave afterwards, he said that he'd failed it eight times. So I'm sure there was a little bit of competition going on. But the point was, so, so what I did is I bought myself a, a map of LA and, and almost planned the route as well. So, um, so all of these little stages were all kind of scripted. I think the research was also a very important part of that particular sequence and it's something I love doing. And the silent hero, the Ryan Gosling driver character, is that, a, is that the kind of hero you like to write? No, that was, there, was a, there was a fabulous book. Um, it, was, it didn't really have the same storyline but it had this fantastic central character and, and when I read the book um, it immediately reminded me of the idea of the man with no name who comes into um, the, the sort of, you know, comes into the, the, the small village and, and saves everyone and then leaves and no one knows who he is. So it's very much sort of using films I loved as well. I mean, that, that's why I enjoyed this so much, was it was, it was, um, it was sort of cannibalising other movies, but also it was a beautiful book and, and, and it was a chance to do, you know, film noir, which is a genre I've always really loved. Well, I noticed the, the book doesn't begin with uh, this heist and drive sequence. It begins with something else altogether. Mm. I knew that, that there's quite a lot of setup before you get to the action in the movie. And, and Universal, who I'd originally sort of written it for, with a studio you sort of can't hang around. They, they sort of want to see the action beats. So in order to buy myself 30 pages where I could just spend on character and sort of establishing driver in the love story, I knew I had to have sort of seven pages of action at the beginning. And when you get or when you got a commission like this, you were the first person on, there was no director attached, no actor. Um, what, what was the commission? Take the book and do what you want with it? Or was there a direction and a steer no, that you were given? No, the commission was um, um, stunt driver by day, getaway driver by night. Um, which is a great catchphrase, and I'm sure that, that was already sort of going to be what was on the poster. But um, it was an incredibly dark book, which is very unusual for a studio um, to commission, um, which is why I jumped at the chance, because it was sort of getting paid a studio rate to do something fantastic like that. Um, but they didn't like the first or the second draft, and it was eventually put in turnaround um, and became a much, much smaller uh, independent movie. And to what extent did the um, process of bringing on a director and uh, the casting of Ryan Gosling affect the, uh, evolve, the evolving nature of the screenplay and what you were writing? Well, what Nicholas Reffin did, which, is, which was, for me was a terrific kind of um, way to work, was he just, we, we had 120 odd page scripts started off with. And then he said, look, I, don't, I haven't got enough money to shoot this. I don't have enough days to get it done. So let's just cut it down. And that's all we did. We didn't really add very much. It was really just this thing of taking the script and, and I think it was something like 90, 89 pages by the end of it. So it was almost like working with an editor in a cutting room where, where we're just going through. The other thing he did, which I absolutely loved, was, was made me sit down with each of the actors from the smallest parts to, 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 to Ryan uh, and spend a whole day just going through what they thought about the character, you know, the changes. He was, he was very, very, he was very comfortable leaving me alone with the actors. Um, and, and that was a process that I really enjoyed. And I, I sort of found, and I've sort of found subsequently, and it's something I'd love to be able to keep doing, is, is working with actors once the script has got to a certain stage, because I think they have certain insights, ideas, and, and ultimately they're the people who have to say those lines. So I've become much less precious about, um, nailing the dialogue in draft one or two because I know that at some stage they're going to come on and they're going to want changes and it's got to fit their patterns of delivery and, and it, it's great to be part of that process. Well we're going to come back to Drive but actually I'd like to go right back to um, one of the first things you wrote, at least your first feature film which is Jude um, and uh, if we look at the clip that we've picked from Jude, we'll notice two of our finest actors quite early on in their careers, Kate Winslet and Chris Eccleston, but perhaps you could 
set it up for us? It's basically um, Jude and Sue who, um, who, who, who have had a terrible tragedy happen in their life. Um, and she feels incredibly guilty about what's happened. And in this scene, he tries to persuade her to, um, to come back to him. Um, and then we'll see what happens. You have to listen to me. Come home. No, I can't. It's all right, Jude. We'll I know what to do. I have to go back to Richard in the morning. You go too. Write to Arabella. Ask her to take they you mean back. They nothing to us. We're still married to no, him. No, you and I are married. But not you in heaven. I'm married if I'm not in this church. On this I married Richard in a With church, a piece Jude. Of paper. I want to go back to him. Do you care for him? Do you love him? I'll learn to love no. him. How can you, Sue? You love me. You love me, Sue. So, how much was there, and what sort of process did you have to go through to reduce it to what we see in that scene? All of those scenes pretty much exist. Um, I think that's about five or six pages, and, and it's all dialogue in the book. So, most of the dialogue there is from the book, um, but it's, it's obviously just completely filleted down, which was the process, you know, particularly in adapting Jude that I had to do. It was the first, it was the first book I adapted, and I, I, I sort of had this system of going through it on, a, on cards, writing down every single scene, then, you know, going through the cards and, and getting rid of some, inventing new scenes very, very rarely where I just needed to make links. And, and that was, it's probably the only adaptation I've done where I've, I've, I've sort of been, used the book, because normally what I'd do, actually the other books I've done have tended not to have scenes or been very different from what the <laughs> screenplays ended up. But with, with Jude, because it's such a linear story and with, with these very well-crafted scenes and stuff, it was a question of choosing and, and unfortunately having to, to lose stuff. It was, it was definitely more craft than anything else, because I think, I think Hardy had done so much of of, of the work narratively that it was really about trying to shape it. It's interesting, I mean, you wrote this nearly 20 years ago. If you were to take on something like Jude now, would you approach it differently or would that be the same um, process? I, I don't know that I'd try to adapt Jude if, if I was, I mean, the, the, the reason, at the time, it was, the fa it, was, it was literally the only thing I'd been offered that was, was a feature film. So I would have done anything. I really would have done. I didn't, um, and I remember um, um, my agent, Nick Marston, who's still my agent, and he sort of, he told me this had come up and, he, and, and that Michael wanted to know if I'd read it. And I, I lied and said I had, I absolutely hadn't read it. And because it was the first film, I sort of paid it a lot more attention. And I, I remember standing outside um, a, a cinema and just seeing how, it was opening night and seeing how, and everyone would, um, come up to, you know, to buy their tickets, and I'd overhear people saying, "Oh, that got good. Jude got quite good reviews." And they go, "Oh no, it's supposed to be really depressing. Let's go and see <laughs> the Nutty Professor." And everyone, <laughs> you know, and and I can kind of understand it because it was on a Friday night. And one of the problems I've had is I, I've sort of all of my film kind of falling in love with film experiences happened on Monday afternoons, and <laughs> people, you know, go to the cinema partly, you know, largely for entertainment. And I think it's certainly not entertaining and it's it sort of, there are other ways we, we kind of, you know, have that intellectual stimulation and, 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 and it sort of, and I'd look, I'd still love to write something, I'm very proud of it, but I do question its commercial validity in an industry where you have to make money in order to justify doing the next thing and, and, and it's a lot of money to make a film. How much of yourself do you put into your, um, into your work? I, I put all my taste in it, and I, I think that's why I'll, I'll, I'll... Probably the next thing I'll do is going to be just as dark and depressing as that. And actually, the only ones I've been able to, to do which aren't like that and have some sort of commercial thing when I've been doing rewrites on studio movies. After Jude and the success of Jude, um, you got the label for being the period man and the, the guy who could adapt our uh, classics in a interesting and um, original way and uh, perhaps we could go on to talk about what you put in of yourself to Wings of a Dove yep. and maybe you could set up the first clip for us. So this is a scene where the, the, the story is really about these two uh, these two lovers who conspire to um, 
they befriend this sick, dying girl and um, sort of think by uh, the woman who is played by Helena Bonham Carter, who's, who's not in this scene but a later scene, convinces her boyfriend, played by Linus Roach, to seduce uh, Millie, the dying girl, and um, so that she will leave him and therefore them her money at the end. Uh, what happens is he starts to really fall in love with her. And in this scene, she's found out their plot and he goes to try to tell her that, that it's not, uh, that he never meant to kind of hurt her and stuff like that. So it's really, it's his apology. I feel better in the mornings. It's such a big city, but I thought I might see you wandering around. I thought the same. Where did you go? San Marco, the Rialto, all the places we went together. Maybe we'd just kept missing each other. Me turning the corner just as you went the other I way. I thought of that, so I stayed in the same place and waited for hours. And we still didn't see each other. When we go back to London. I'm not going anywhere. What we do here the same things we did before. Do I look like I can climb a church scaffold? You can do anything you want. Not anymore. I believed him when he said he'd stood in one spot and waited for hours. Well, no, that was, that was actually something that had happened to me. I, I, there was, um, I'd, I'd been in Venice, I, I sort of went quite a few times as a student because it, the, book, the book is the Henry James book, there aren't really any scenes in it, everything's sort of reported off screen. So, it, for example, that scene, there's, there, there's, there's no scene written, you just hear from somebody else that, that Merton went and confessed to me as far as I remember. So, so it, was, um, it was, it made it really exciting to adapt because it was, in a way, it was, it was A, everyone sort of thought that, you know, the later Henry James sort of novels were unadaptable, which sort of took some of the pressure off. Um, <laughs> and, and because they weren't, they weren't some, they weren't really scenes, I, I, I felt free to kind of invent them. Both with Drive and Wings of the Dove, even though very few of the scenes um, in the book, uh, in, in the screenplay exist in the book, um, what both writers, James Silas, you know, and Henry James do is, is just create these extraordinary characters um, that are so brilliantly described that actually you sort of become, it becomes very easy to, to write dialogue for them, even if that dialogue doesn't exist in the books because they're so well defined and you know so much about them that there's, it sort of flows and it's, it's, it's really, it's their writing, not me. I just sort of feel that, that, you know, the characters are so well drawn. Seeing the way the lines fit so comfortably in the mouths of actors and hearing you talk about Nick Refn and the experience with Drive, I just wondered whether we should cue the last yeah. clip as a, in Get order to give actors. you a, an opportunity to talk sure. about actors. I think we would have made a go at this business. Don't worry, don't, don't worry, that's it. It's done. There's no pain, it's over, it's over. scene is, is completely inspired by something I've always, I, I was reading in, it's a Hitchcock quote about um, filming your love scenes like, like murders and your murders like love scenes. And then the scene afterwards, obviously, it's like he's almost mourning, like he's broken up with someone. So it was that idea of, um, you know, that these, these sort of men almost in love are, are in, you know, ending up killing each other. I thought there was just something, um, very, and that, that was again a scene that's not in, in the book but was inspired by these two great characters in the, who, who are in the book. 
And did um, did the cast themselves bring anything to Yes, the it was scene? really... Um, this was going back to um, what Nicholas said, it made him making me sit down. I mean, he'd, be, he'd go off location scouting and I'd be left with them saying, I don't like my scene, I don't like my line. <laughs> and like this and, and like... So, right he was, <laughs> <laughs> so he was safe. In, in, uh, um, so originally the way the scene had been written was that Bernie Rose comes to hug him and stabs him. And Brian Cranston was kind of going, um, um, that sounds like a painful way to kill someone you really, you know, you like. Apparently it's painless if you, you know, slash the wrist. And I don't know if that's true or not, but it certainly sounded good and he seemed pretty convinced. So that idea came from him. And I'm sort of sitting there listening and thinking, oh, that's kind of interesting. So then I'd go away the next day and write. And quite, quite often it was, it was it's a very privileged position to be um, a writer in an actor's rehearsal. Um, and even more so in a case like this, where you're sort of almost, you know, leading the rehearsal in the sense that they're talking and you're kind of taking ideas in terms of how to write the scene. And, and it does bring me to the, back to the point that I think writers are quite often the most important or, or potentially the best collaborators for, for screenwriters. And quite often the most valuable notes I've had uh, have been from actors. I mean, the really interesting is like, like um, like what their first line is, is, is they sort of need, I've sort of found that they need a strong first line to sort of define them, to help them play the part. And I sort of found it very, very interesting and useful just to follow their instincts in the later stages of, of, of the script when th the structural work has been done and the scenes have their shape. Um, brings me to another point, which is quite often actors will claim that they rewrote the scene or, or, or whatever. Which, which is true to a certain extent, but, it, but, it, but I think, and I think every writer will say this, is you wouldn't have been able to write it if the scene hadn't been there in the first place. And every, all, all, you know, the blocks are there for them. And then I think it's fine to let them kind of riff and change a line here or there because it's, it's the shape is there and the shape isn't going to change that much. I suppose it's the same thing with pace as well. You can suggest the pace, but you can't dictate it. You can't dictate pace, but, I mean, sort of being a sneaky writer, you can try to manipulate... Um, like the with pauses, and I love pauses because I think generally I, I like I like the reactions to a line that's said probably more than the line sometimes. So what I'll tend to do is 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 write a line in between two lines of dialogue, um, and they're usually really bad because it's she stares out or he reflects or something like that. But it's sort of but it's still sort of creating a sort of rhythm. Now whether they they the director sort of sticks to that, that's that's. That's really up to them, but, but you try to do it, or you start a scene by writing, describing. I mean, I don't like doing close-up on lamp or whatever, but by starting with what you want the first shot of the film to be, so if you describe that lamp, there's a slim chance that the director might start it like that. Well, uh, I'm going to have to share you with the audience, but before I do that, I will just take lead from that note from you and ask you how you have found it directing, because you're in post-production on your directorial debut, which is you directing yourself as a writer, adapting Patricia Highsmith, and perhaps you can tell us what you've learned. Lessons I've learned. I mean, things like... I mean, it's part of that... That's, I think, something I'd recommend to any writer is, is to spend time in a cutting room because you learn so many things that like how long a scene usually can be, what goes out, coming in in the middle uh, of a scene, how much, you know, and, and, and all those rules. But beyond that, there's also, um, like on, once you're faced with problems that, as a director, that you've caused yourself as a writer. <laughs> so th there are bits where I had, I don't know, three long dialogue scenes back to back. and. I'll probably do it again, but I swear right now that I'll try not to <laughs> because it's sort of in the cutting room you find, you know, the, the, the thing I'd always underestimate is how important momentum is and that's something you really learn in the cutting room more than you do on the page because when you're writing a script or reading a script, you can go back and forth and it doesn't bore you. Um, once it's shot, it becomes this sort of one and a half hour, two hour train and it's just moving. Um, so, for example, I learned that you can start a film as a drama, if it then turns into a thriller in its sort of next 10 pages or whatever, I think it's very tough for an audience to then go back to the pace of a drama again. So I think you can, I mean, Drive just about gets away with it, but, but, but it's, still, it's still 
you know, th that whole thinking about how an audience is going to spend those two hours. And that's, that's quite a big leap from the page when you're writing a screenplay to imagining the finished film in terms of its pace and rhythm and momentum. But it's something I really... That's why I've realised how important structure and, 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 and momentum and, and balancing of action scenes with dialogue scenes or, or thrillist suspense scenes with, with character scenes. And, and it's, it's thinking about those combinations, I think, is really important, something I certainly learned really from difficulties in the cutting room. Can um, we have some hands for questions from the audience? You mentioned research uh, with Drive. Do you feel it's problematic when you come to something that uh, you you have experience of? I, th I think I think it's it's problematic, but but you do. I mean, if if you if you're the, the moment you agree to adapt a book, there's obviously something in it that's touched you, and 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 it touches you because it's it hits some personal note. So I think I think there is that response. So that's. That that and, and and the research can only really sort of help that and augment it. But 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 it's sort of um, the, the, the the most important thing for me, sort of in, in adapting a book, is, is really there's a feeling when you read a book, and I'm sure everyone here has had it, where you get so immersed in it and you enjoy it so much that you feel that nobody else has read the book like you've read the book. If you were to meet um, your younger you, say when you were 18, what advice would you give to yourself? I'd say don't sign exclusive deals with. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a very long exclusive deal with um, with Miramax, um, sort of, and it was it was an odd deal because it was I sort of realised that the that the films that I wanted to do weren't necessarily the films they wanted to do, and I ended up doing quite a lot of rewrites and stuff for them. Um, and I learned an incredible amount because it, it is, it's, it's, you're suddenly thrown into things that you wouldn't necessarily choose, so you're having to... I think the craft gets stronger. Um, I mean, because you're, you're having to, you know, to learn how to make things work that don't necessarily work for you. But I just couldn't work for anyone else. So there was an opportunity, for example, to work on, on Munich, um, the Steven Spielberg film, which I would have, you know, really loved to have been involved in, but because I was exclusive, uh, to Miramax, I wasn't allowed to. You know, just having done a sound mix now for the first time, I'm sort of learning so much about, and I think, well, that can go back to the writing or, or something that the, an editor, I've brilliant editor that I've worked with, made me do with 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 the film I directed was to he cut it into three short films, as it were, so following each character, and it's something I'd probably go back and do with scripts. Is 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 like if I want to unlock something, is take one character's journey and what, all it means is taking out the scenes that they're not in so to see is that character's you know is it consistent is their line is their story within the overall script consistent is it moving is it this and and that's something I learned from an editor in an editing room and I, th I think you can learn so much from other people um, in the industry and, and I sort of wish I'd I'd sort of befriended more people and kind of j just f sort of found you know more people to sort of teach me and that gentleman over there really is the last question, just here. I'm interested in the process, Hoss, about uh, do you follow the same rhythm each day? Do you start at a certain time, stop at a certain time, um, start by doing a certain thing, re-reading what you did yesterday? Or I'm just generally interested in how that works. <laughs> yeah, no, I've got, I've got a completely sort of, I can lay it out for you. I sort of generally start at around 7.30, 7.38 maybe, um, right till about 1 or 2 because I find that anything I write after that, I, I just end up rewriting the same line again and again. So I stop. I stop writing, but then what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of prep for the next day. So I'll either read, research something around the scene I'm writing. I'll watch a movie which is somehow related to the scene I'm writing the next day. Um, and and try to stay in, in some sort of zone because it's sort of, I, I can't do more than one script at a time for that reason. I just sort of need to be quite immersed and I need to stay immersed. And if I, I can, I can be a bit of a pain at home because I'd sort of, I, I like an early, you know, if, I'm, if I've got a big scene to write, I don't really want to go out to a party and, and get drunk and, because I, I need, you know, so I sort of, it's, it's almost like some sort of weird exercise of trying to be, be, be ready. Well, I'm sorry we can't um, invite you back tomorrow night to go through <laughs> a regular session of 
how you do what you do. But thank you so much for sharing your secrets with us. Thank you for coming.